much of Lord Raglan's work in The Hero, a study in tradition, myth and drama, examines the roles of both myths and heroes in an ahistorical context. This approach is deeply flawed and egocentric, and presents the view that there is often little or no basis for evidence that the mythical hero existed historically, but rather has some basis in ritual and drama. There are no valid grounds for believing in the historicity of tradition or really heroes of myth, and that of a saga, far from being a record of fact, is really a novel based chiefly on myth. In essence, Lord Raglan is saying that the hero is formed out of generally archaic traditions. His argument that there is no justification for believing that any of these heroes were real persons is quite ludicrous, and sadly cannot even be argued to be a product of its times. At least ten of the characters that Raglan discusses can be seen to have some historical basis, although it is true that not all of the characters he discusses can be considered either historical or real. That is not to say that the process of ritual around the hero is invalid, as this often occurs when a heroic figure is enshrined in worship as part of a religion or cult, or indeed rendered into the larger awareness through myth. What did represent an interest to Frank Herbert was the way Lord Raglan presented a pattern for the hero's life, 22 ritualistic steps from birth to death which the majority of heroes proceed through during the lifespan of their myth. Brian Herbert refers to his father's study of Lord Raglan's book in Dreamer of Dune, and in particular, Raglan's idea of the ritual pattern. Raglan did believe it would be easy to add additional steps to his pattern. The 22 steps which Raglan created for his blueprint in The Hero are as follows. 1. The hero's mother is a royal virgin. 2. His father is a king. And 3. Often a near relative of his mother, but 4. The circumstances of his conception are unusual and 5. He is also reputed to be a son of a god. 6. At birth an attempt is made, usually by his father or his maternal grandfather, to kill him. But 7. He is spirited away and 8. Reared by foster parents in a far country. 9. We are told nothing of his childhood but 10. On reaching manhood he returns or goes to see his future kingdom. 11. After a victory over the king and or a giant stroke dragon or wild beast, 12. He marries a princess, often the daughter of his predecessor, and 13. Becomes king, 14. For a time he reigns uneventfully, and 15. Prescribes laws, but 16. Later he loses favour with the gods and or his subjects, and 17. Is driven from his throne and city, after which 18. He meets with a mysterious death. 19. Often at the top of a hill. 20. His children, if any, do not succeed him. 21. His body is not buried, but nevertheless. 22. He has one or more holy sepulchres. The character of Paul Atreides follows many of these steps throughout the first great Dune trilogy, and to a certain extent so does his son Leto II. In Dune, Paul moves through this ritual pattern until the point of becoming king, or emperor, which is the thirteenth step on Raglan's list. 1. Not attributed. His mother is actually a Bene Gesserit concubine. 2. His father Leto is a duke. 3. His father is a near relative to his mother. Jessica, Duke Leto's concubine, is the daughter of his father's enemy, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. 4. The circumstances of his conception are unusual. His mother, Jessica, is ordered to give birth to a female child. She disobeys out of her love for Leto and conceives a male child instead. He is, however, a product of a breeding program which has been manipulating bloodlines for thousands of years in the hope of creating a super being, a Kwisatz Sadarach, which is essentially a male version of a Bene Gesserit. 5. He is considered to be a messiah the Mahdi or Lisan al-Gib by the Fremen, and a potential Kwisatz Sadarach by the Bene Gesserit. 6. An attempt is made to kill him by his maternal grandfather, though in his youth rather than at birth. This occurs when he arrives on Arrakis, which can be seen as his symbolic rebirth. 
7. He is spirited away both to Arrakis and later into the desert to escape the Harkonnen. 8. Where he is looked after and educated by the Fremen in the ways of the desert. 9. We know little of his childhood, Paul is 15 when we first meet him. 10. On reaching manhood, he goes to his future kingdom, the planet Arrakis. 11. He conquers the worms, Shai Halud and Shaitan of Arrakis, comparable to slaying a dragon or attaining the pearl of great wisdom. 12. He marries a princess, Irulan, who is the daughter of his predecessor, the Emperor Shaddam IV. Irulan is a wife in name only. Paul takes for his concubine the woman he loves, Chani, the daughter of Liet Kynes, who is also, in a sense, his predecessor. 13. He becomes emperor of the known universe and the leader of his own all encompassing religion. Paul continues in the tradition of Raglan's ritual steps in the second and third parts of the first trilogy, Dune Messiah and Children of Dune. Again, Paul fulfills most of the latter stages with the exceptions of steps 19 and 20. That is, he does not die atop a hill, and his child Leto II does succeed him both in undertaking the Golden Path and becoming Emperor. In that sense, Paul Atreides fulfills 19 of the 22 steps described in Lord Raglan's pattern, matching the scores of both King Arthur and Dionysus. Only three so called mythical figures presented by Raglan score more, with Moses and Theseus both scoring 20, and Oedipus alone scores 22. In his conclusion to the use of his heroic scale, Raglan, firm in his belief that these heroic figures have no basis in reality or history, states that the historical figure applied to this scale seldom scores more than six or seven points. The conclusion that suggests itself is that the god is the hero as he appears in ritual, and the hero is the god as he appears in myth. In other words, the hero and the god are two different aspects of the same superhuman being. It is not my intent to debate Raglan's attitude towards the heroic ideal in myth, or the fact that he fundamentally fails to realise that the hero quite often appears in source material other than novels, epics and sagas. His work has been the subject of much heated discussion over the years since the hero was written, but regardless of this fact, the point here is to show his influence on Frank Herbert, and in particular, the steps that he sends his very non-archetypal hero, Paul Atreides, through. Raglan's words above are very much mirrored by Frank Herbert in Dune Messiah, and illustrate very nicely the influence Raglan's book had upon him. There exists no separation between gods and men. One blends softly casual into the other. Proverbs of Moadib. <laughs>